Good afternoon, I'm Shelly Mahendra, and although I'm a city girl, always been, I would love to live in a place like this, clean, green, pristine environment. Well, let's face it, a lot of our environment is dirty. And in addition to the trash and the piles of dirt that you're seeing, what we don't see is the water resources, the soil and groundwater is also contaminated. It is my job to take this to back to clean environment. So I do that at UCLA uh, in my research. I'm, I'm an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering. The conventional technologies to clean groundwater specifically sometimes just don't work. There are air stripping towers, there's carbon sorption, don't always work for all kinds of pollutants. The technologies that do work are extremely expensive when we're dealing with vast volumes of really polluted water. What we do sometimes is move pollution from one place to another. But that doesn't get rid of the hazard. The poisons are still there. To, in, in light of all this that we know that doesn't always work, my research group, we are evaluating bioremediation. Tell you what bioremediation is. In situ, that means we work at the site that's contaminated. We don't have to truck garbage or water or dirt from one place to another. Bio, which means we use microbes, microscopic critters, bacteria and fungi to do their job right there in the environment. And remediation really means to restore or fix so we can take contaminated environment back to clean environment. Specifically, we look at the next generation of contaminants that are, that are going to be found in our drinking water. Um, one of the things that we look at are called perfluorinated compounds. They're found in firefighting foam and, and nonstick cookware and a variety of scratch resistant coatings that, that we have. Also nanomaterials, they're used in a variety of applications uh, from titanium dioxide in sunscreen, silver in our washing machine, uh, nanotubes in electronics and automobile applications. We think that in another few decades, two or three decades, they're gonna be found all over the environment and we don't know how much there's out there, what it can do to us or, or how to deal with this, deal with that potentially toxic substance that we are adding to the environment. Today I'm gonna to tell you about a special, a very, uh, some, some, a chemical, 1,4-dioxane, that I've worked with for about 10 years now. 1,4-dioxane causes cancer. It's a common industrial uh, chemical that's found in a variety of applications, paper manufacturing, solvents, uh, filters, cellulose, textiles. It's also found in our personal care products, lots of cosmetics, makeup, baby shampoo, lotions everywhere. So we are being exposed to it. And I just told you, it causes cancer. So one way where my research group, all of us work together and we, in, we work on bioremediation of 1,4-dioxane. 1,4-dioxane, as I said, it's commonly found. When we look for it, we find it everywhere. It's a common groundwater pollutant. It's infinitely soluble in water, so it just travels with water, and it has a potential to impact large number of people, large number of places, rather quickly. So it's ideally suited for in situ bioremediation. This is an organism we work with. It's called Pseudonocardia dioxinivorans. This thing makes a living out of eating dioxin. It eats dioxin. It loves dioxin. Um, I've, I've worked with it, I characterized this bacterium. Isn't that a good looking bacterium? And uh, I even got to name it, Pseudonocardia. That Pseudonocardia that voraciously eats 1,4-dioxane. Recently, uh, together with other collaborators, we sequenced the entire DNA genome of this organism. So now we know what the secrets the DNA holds and how we can put it to use in actual field application of bioremediation. My research group at UCLA, we develop omics-based tools. We know about the DNA. We can use genomic information. We can use gene chips, messenger RNA, transcriptomics. We understand the protein profile when it's working. We also understand the metabolic pathways. How does it all work? How can this thing make a living out of eating dioxane and then help us humans clean our environment? It seems to be a win-win. It's fascinating. Another thing that we do is we monitor dioxane and the progress of bioremediation using something that we call stable isotopes. And I'm gonna use this jelly bean analogy. As dioxane is removed from our environment, the total number of jelly beans, they go down. But it could happen with any combination of random environmental processes. 
to confirm, to make sure, to validate that bioremediation is indeed happening, we look for signatures, and they are different for every compound. So in this case, as the total number of jelly beans goes down, and it gets richer in the red jelly beans, so white get eaten faster than red ones, that's a very solid proof that indeed in situ bioremediation is happening. And that's the kind of work that I do in my lab. So with the help of awesome students and colleagues and sponsors, I hope to take my work from the field, from the lab, into the field and actually make a difference. Thank you very much.